Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, today we are going to finish the discussions, unfinished discussion that we left in the uh, last uh, lesson and uh, then we are going to move ahead with uh, geologic hazards related to landslides. So first of all we are going to talk about uh, geologic hazards related to shoreline processes which was really an unfinished uh, business from the last lesson and then we are going to move ahead with the new topic. Okay. So uh, instructional objectives of this particular lesson are as follows. Uh, at the end of this uh, lesson we would like to be able to uh, list the causes of shoreline erosion and deposition and the uh, uh, relevant mitigation strategies that are used to go around these problems. Then we are going to look at the causes of landslides and uh, we are going to wrap this lesson up with the classification of landslides. So these are the topics that we are going to cover in this particular lesson and now uh, getting back to the discussion that we uh, left unfinished in the uh, last lesson. We are looking at mitigation measures against uh, shoreline processes. So essentially what we were looking for, uh, we were looking at the erosion and deposition due to uh, wave actions really and uh, here we, our concern is to, uh, find, is to look at the mitigation processes uh, that are required to go around these problems. Now uh, in order to, in order to uh, identify a proper mitigation measure, you need to have a few considerations and these are extremely important. Uh, what you need to realize is that shorelines are often in a state of dynamic equilibrium under the input wave energy and resistance to erosion. So what it means is that if you alter the balance between the input energy and the resistance to erosion, then it is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the system is going to try to regain the balance by some means and if the alteration is too much, in other words, if you disturb the balance between the input wave energy and uh, the uh, resistance to erosion by too much then the, uh, the, the balance will be uh, disturbed by quite a significant margin and as a result the detrimental effect of that unbalanced situation is going to be visible at some location maybe other than uh, the location where the mitigation measure is, uh, is undertaken. So what we have to ensure during uh, during uh, identification of these mitigation measures is that we want to actually disturb the balance by as little as possible. So that is really the second point under the first uh, main uh, point uh, which is brute force interventions are often counterproductive. That means you need to realize that if you, if you uh, disturb the balance between input energy and the resistance to erosion by too much, then the effect may be detrimental. Although the detrimental effect will not be visible at the location where the intervention is being uh, completed, but the effects, bad effects are going to be felt uh, probably uh, elsewhere in that area. Second point to consider is that we need to really usually uh, we need to really establish a control over uh, in the usual scenario over erosion, transportation and deposition under the different types of waves that are uh, going to affect the coastal area namely the uh, onshore current which is uh, which are the waves that are uh, directed towards the shoreline, offshore currents, uh, these are the waves that are uh, directed away from the shoreline and longshore currents which are the waves that move parallel to the direction of the waves, uh, direction of the shoreline. So 
erosion accordingly is going to take place under the action of each one of these waves. Uh, so, we have to uh, look for mitigation measures depending on which action, which type of wave action is prevailing. So, uh, here are the details longshore erosion and deposition. Uh, these, this type of erosion and deposition process uh, affects uh, navigation channels and this is quite obvious if you uh, consider a sketch. Uh, let us say, let us say you have got a navigation channel that goes inland into a harbor and this is our coastline where the current is directed, longshore current is directed in this manner and if this particular current deposits uh, sediments at the mouth of the of the uh, of the uh, channel Na this is the navigation channel that we were looking at by the way this particular sketch i'm i'm showing a plan view of a harbor work so this is our navigation channel and this is the direction of uh, of uh, longshore current. So, this one here is the direction of longshore current. And this is the location where the main deposition is uh, taking place under the longshore current which is of our, our interest because this is the area which is going to affect the draft necessary for movement of different uh, uh, water vessels, the different, different, uh, different vessels that would like to uh, utilize this particular harbor. So, what we do in this case, uh, typically you need to uh, you need to have a control over the longshore uh, deposition process and typically what is done here is a series of groins are constructed in this manner. So, groins are essentially uh, wall like uh, wall like protrusions almost perpendicular to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, coastline. So, this is our coastline if you recall, this one is our coastline, coast uh, coastline. So, we utilize, we install a series of groins, so called groins. to control the longshore uh, current and the deposition near the mouth of the navigation channel. So, this is one of the intervention scheme as we are going to look uh, as we are going to see in the next little bit. Uh, and uh, onshore and jetties are also similar structures to groins basically. So, they uh, really uh, cut down the, uh, the velocities uh, longshore, uh, longshore current velocities or wave action near the mouth of a navigation navigation channel. Now, onshore and offshore erosion and deposition, this actually takes place under the action of onshore and offshore currents and they really reshape uh, uh, coastlines if they uh, if the main environment in a particular area is erosional. So, the coastline is going to recede uh, landward whereas if the uh, if the area is uh, a depositional environment then the coastline is going to uh, move further towards the water now in order to control the movement of the coastline typical measures include bulkheads revetments boulder pitching and rubble mound seawalls let's look at these uh, measures so, here we are looking at a uh, few cross sections. So, basically 
boulder pitched sea wall is a trapezoidal wall constructed a uh, little bit offshore and they have got heavy boulders uh, at the surface and little bit finer ones within the core areas. So, this is the typical details of a uh, rubble mount. and the water is uh, like this. So, this is our coastline then. And here as I mentioned we are looking at the cross section of the of the coastal area. Uh, this is the this is a typical uh, typical uh, wave break rubble mount and then uh, we have got other measures such as bulkheads, revetments, uh, bulkheads and revetments. Let us look at what are those. So, in a in case of a bulkhead, if this is the coastline, what you are going to have is to install a barrier which may be comprised of a sheet pile uh, wall such as the one that we looked at some time back uh, when we were talking about ground water and then behind the wall you construct a backfill uh, you backfill this area behind the wall and this is basically a shoreline stabilization measure. So, this one here is called a bulkhead. Uh, this is not visibly very uh, appealing because uh, at the shoreline you are going to see the face of the sheet pile wall or any such wall that you might actually construct along the waterfront. So, in this case the water is going to be like this and uh, the coastline is going to be reshaped like that. And the other measure was uh, that of boulder pitching that is also carried out quite often. Uh, in this particular case what you do is uh, the shoreline, the, the waterfront, what the, the uh, face of the soil or soil soil slope typically is pitched with heavy boulder, heavy boulders up to the height uh, where the wave action is going to be felt. In this manner, so uh, since the boulders are too heavy for the water wave to erode as a result erosional areas of a coastline is can be stabilized in this manner. And instead of boulders sometimes uh, special concrete blocks uh, which are specially uh, which are structurally erosion resistant they are also sometimes used. So, this is the other means of controlling onshore and offshore erosion and deposition. All right. Now, we move on to our new topic because uh, we are now at an end of uh, the discussion that we were having about uh, wave action. We are now going to move ahead with the discussion on landslides or the first of all we are going to look at uh, the different types of uh, landslides and the causes of those landslides and in the following lesson we are going to look at the mitigation processes that are uh, that are normally utilized in order to minimize the uh, the landslide hazard uh, or control or, or mitigate or minimize the risk related to the uh, to landslide hazard now what is landslide that is the first question that comes to mind 
So, landslide really is a move is a movement of geologic materials such as soil, rock or mixture of those under the action of gravity and such movement can be caused by degradation of shear strength, increase of driving force due to human action or meteorologic or hydraulic causes or because of earthquakes and vibrations. Now, landslides, uh, I am going to actually distinguish landslides, although many other uh, some other researchers may not agree on uh, uh, in, in this matter with me, but I am going to I am going to say landslides are those are those slope instabilities which affect a relatively larger area. Typically, we are looking at a few hundred, a few hundred meter area uh, as a bare minimum in order to classify that particular uh, mass wasting process as a landslide. And slope stability on the other hand is, is basically uh, of a smaller scale. Although, you may say that both slope stability and landslide from mechanistic point of view or from engineering perspective, they are often handled in the same manner by engineers. Okay, so, those are the definition part that, that was the definition part of landslide. Now, we look at the types of landslide. Uh, there are several different ways in which you could classify landslides. Uh, the first mode of classification uses whether the landslide is structurally controlled or not, or whether the uh, process is taking place through pre existing planes of weaknesses, such as uh, if the uh, movement is taking place along pre existing joint set, then we are going to cause we are going to call that particular landslide as a structurally controlled landslide. Now, there are three types here. One is called consequent landslide. Here, the landslide is structurally controlled or the landslide could be asequent or insequent. An asequent landslide is essentially a, an, a slope instability that arises in massive formations, which does not have any joints or cracks. An insequent landslide uh, is a process that takes place in, in blocks which could be jointed or cracked, but the instability or the, or the, uh, or the surface through which the instability is taking place actually cuts across those joints. So, that type is called insequent landslide. Let us look at what are these things. So, let us say you have got a slope where there are joint sets like this. This is a schematic picture of a cross section run through a particular slope and if this particular and, and, the, and the material underneath this jointed rock is massive and quite stable and if this rock slides down slope in this manner, then this particular landslide is going to be called a consequent landslide. Then let us go and look at the other extreme. In this case, let us consider a slope in clay where uh, there are no cracks or lenses or soft lens or uh, weak lenses through which the landslide can progress. It is a deposit of massive clay. In this case, often what happens, the failure surface takes the shape of a circle and uh, this type of landslide is going to be called an asequent 
landslide. An insequent landslide is one where there could be cracks in clay like this. Let us say there is a crack in the in clay and there is a silicon side like this, but still, but still the the failure is taking place not through these planes of weaknesses, but across or away from these planes of weaknesses, then this type of landslide is going to be called in sequent uh, landslide. So, three types then based on whether the landslide is structurally controlled or not. If it is not structurally controlled, the, the uh, landslide could be either asequent or in sequent. And if it is structurally controlled, then it is going to be called uh, consequent landslide. There are other types of classification as we are going to see here. Uh, we are going to call a landslide an active landslide if you have got recent movement, if it, it is going to be called a dormant landslide where at the present time there is no movement, but if the move if the area is going is uh, likely to be dis if it is destabilized, then uh, that is going to trigger a movement. That type of landslide is called a dormant landslide and inactive landslide is basically a pre-existing landslide that has uh, moved so much that at the present time or in the present geometry, the landslide has stabilized. So, active landslide, what are the indicators of an active landslide? Let us say it could be a if it is due to a recent fast movement, then you are not going to find any vegetation on the slope face. If it is a young uh, active landslide, which is also a fast moving one, then there would be young trees and shrubs. And if there, are, there is a slow moving slide, ongoing slow moving sliding, then the trees are going to be tilted because of the movement. And some of the trees might even have a bent trunk because the movement is too slow or it might have been stabilized at some point. Uh, then another indicator of an active landslide is that the scarp because of landslide is going to be visible. Now, you should recall the definitions from of uh, these different uh, terminology that we are using here from the lessons that we had quite a few uh, uh, quite a few lessons ago, we discussed about these uh, terms. So, in order to jog your memory a little bit, what is uh, meant by a scarp is this. And let us say you have got a landslide that is taking place like this. the slope has moved uh, moved downward, the material has moved downward leaving a relatively steep surface behind. This particular movement began from this location. So, this is the direction of movement and the landslide has moved in this manner. So, this particular so this particular line here, if you recall, I am looking at in this particular drawing, I have tried to draw an isometric uh, view of the uh, slope. So, this particular surface or this particular line is called the scarp of the landslide, if you recall from the discussion that we had some time back. Now, if we in, in case of an active landslide, the time available for erosional processes to, uh, to uh, obliterate the presence of this particular scarp 
has caused this carp to be visible on the map and from visible scarps, failure scarps, uh, often active presence of an active landslide is uh, inferred. Now, now comes the dormant landslide which is somewhere in between the other two extremes active and inactive. In case of a dormant landslide there are going to be some vegetation growth and this growth could be as much as the vegetation growth in the area not affected by landslide around the landslide. And in this case the scarp which, which was there in the beginning that might have been obliterated by the erosional process. So, the scarp may or may not be visible on the, uh, on the geologic map or geomorphologic map. Then, the, then comes inactive landslide. This particular type of landslide, uh, there are going to be very little visible sign at the surface and often an inactive landslide is identifiable only from a very detailed and careful subsurface exploration. And actually speaking, uh, inactive landslide is not of uh, a great engineering interest because they have already stabilized. So, they are not going to be of any consequence uh, in the construction uh, in, in and around that particular area. Then there could be another types of landslide classification and this typing uh, adheres, looks at the mechanism that triggers the landslide. So, landslide uh, could be classified as a fall or a topple, there could be a rotational slide, there could be a translational slide, uh, then there could be flows, creep and complex landslide. A complex landslide is really a combination of uh, w uh, more than one of the types that precedes uh, in the list. Okay. So, let us look at what are these things one by one. Fall and topple, what it means is that it involves free fall or toppling of rock mass. Usually, this involves weathered or jointed rock mass. This type of landslide could be extremely fast and this is triggered uh, because of pre-existing joints undermining, frost wedging, crack propagation, vibration and tumbling of parched rock or erratics. We are going to look at uh, each of these things one by one and some of them are explained in the cartoons that are going to come now. So, this one here shows a section of a waterfront where the water is on the right uh, right hand side of this particular cross section and what is here is that at the surface you have got erosion resistant rock such as uh, such as uh, sandstone or uh, compact limestone and underneath the uh, erosion resistant rock there is a softer variety which is exposed to the wave action of the water and it is erodible as a result and because of that what has happened it is the, the water has eaten into the softer uh, bedro bedrock underlying the surface uh, rock which is more resistant to weathering and erosion and this process continues until the, uh, the protruding slab of the surface rock can no longer resist its weight and in that process at that instance the slab is likely to break off and uh, this mechanism is going to initiate a rock fall. Then we have got uh, we have got uh, fall uh, we have got uh, this, this particular uh, uh, section th 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 this particular cartoon actually illustrates the process of toppling what has happened here is a 
cracking is cracking of bedrock near the top of the slope as is seen here and what what could happen is water could enter into the cracks there and that water pressure could destabilize the rock at the top corner of the uh, slope in this particular case and also what could happen in addition to it is the water that has entered into the crack near the surface of the uh, of the bedrock near the uh, top surface of the slope of the steep slope it might actually get frozen uh, become frozen during winter time and because of the fact that frozen water has got a larger volume than the original water that infiltrated into the crack that expansion in volume could exert pressure lateral pressure and that pressure could also uh, destabilize uh, the rock and in the process the rock could uh, tumble down the slope it could in the process uh, during the fall it is going to break in, into small pieces and this is one of the processes which is responsible for the development of talus slopes on uh, very steep rock faces in many arid areas arid regions of the world okay so that this particular process is called toppling uh, we need to look at the explanation of uh, a few other things so frost wedging is already explained uh, undermining and pre-existing joints I mean these are the processes which uh, uh, which is illustrated in the previous uh, case where we considered the erosion related undermining of the softer uh, rock layer underneath the superficial more uh, compact and strong and weathering resistant rock uh, in where we were illustrating rock fall uh, what is what needs to be explained here is really the definition of parched rock and erratics uh, before I move on to the next uh, slide so parched rock really is a precariously balanced hu uh, huge piece of rock huge mass of rock at the surface of another formation so this one could be a parched rock and such type of weathering formation could be because of wind or wave erosion and this heavy parched rock is easily destabilized during an earthquake involving uh, involving transient lateral movement so that back and forth shaking in that direction actually could could dislodge that huge piece of rock near the head of the column so that is one way of uh, of triggering rock fall and another more common way is when a slope underlain a slope overlain by erratics is destabilized because of say vibration due to earthquake so these are called erratics what are erratics really they are huge boulders deposited on the slope when it was uh, when glacial advance or ice advance was taking place through the slope and ice melted and in the process these huge boulders they were which were being carried by the ice they get, they might get deposited on a slope face so these this type of rocks are also precariously balanced uh, this these slopes are typically very gentle but they are steep enough to cause the rocks to tumble down slope in the event of a disturbance such as those caused by an earthquake so these are called erratics all right rotational landslide these types of landslide typically affects 
fine or coarse grain soils uh, not uh, not so much they do not occur so much in rocks they are trigger they are triggered because of steepening of slopes loading near the tops earthquakes and vibrations and rainfall and saturation how these uh, mechanisms uh, cause the landslide to uh, to tri cause the cause, cause the landslide to get initiated we are going to look at that in the next little bit but before that let's look at the features of rotational landslide so this is really a rotational landslide in which we are looking at a cross section of a slope underlain by relatively homogeneous uh, soil or rock in this case uh, in many cases the slope failure is going to take a uh, it is going to have a circular failure surface as is indicated by the orange line there and the uh, mass of soil or rock above that particular circle is going to start tumbling down slope or there could be in the process of tumbling down the uh, the uh, the block could break down and there could be in the process a progressive or retrogressive failure uh, occur, uh, taking place uh, because of the breaking action. Typically what happens, these slopes are most unstable near the bottom of the slope. So a small failure is triggered near the bottom of the, of the uh, slope and this particular failure leads to the uh, leads to the slumping of a small mass near the toe of the slope and it leaves a failure scarp, a small failure scarp if you will uh, near the bottom portion of the slope and as you recall from the discussion that we had before, failure scarp is really a very steep face, a steep face of soil or rock and since the face is steep, it is going to be relatively unstable and because of that instability another failure is going to be triggered this time from a little bit further back along the slope or further up along the slope and in that manner the slope failure is going to progress backward and eventually a relatively much larger mass is going to be involved in the failure. So let's look at, uh, let's look at the triggering mechanisms that lead to this kind of uh, that could lead to this type of failure first we talked about steepening of slope so let's say you have got a hill slope which is of this uh, geometry if for some reason we excavate a steep slope on the face of the of the uh, hill slope natural hill slope and remove the rock like this, then because of this steepening, you can easily see uh, that the the uh, the the portion of the slope out here in this portion, this area is going to be affected is likely to be affected by uh, slope. Instable, potential slope instability because of the steep cut that has been installed in this particular construction. So that is uh, steepening, steepening. Here again we are looking at a cross section of the slope. So this is this was the original uh, hill slope, and this is this here is the cut. We looked at. Uh, some time back we looked at the stability issues associated with this type of uh, cut which could be uh, constructed in the first place to accommodate a road cut, accommodate a hill road for that matter. Okay, Then there could be a situation in which a slope that is otherwise, uh, otherwise stable during dry season because the water table un underneath the slope occurs at a depth like the, at a depth 
like this and let's say let's say the slope uh, let's say during the during the uh, rainy season so this is the this is the uh, dry season water level now if for some reason the water table goes to a shallower depth and this one is our slope face surface then what happens uh, if you recall from uh, the uh, lessons that we had before that the effective stress within a soil element at some depth is going to decrease when the water table goes up in this fashion and because of the decreased effective stress the strength the frictional strength of the soil is also going to decrease and this event could actually if the decrease in soil strength is quite enormous quite large in that case this particular process of, uh, of uh, raising a water table is going to cause the slope to get destabilized. So, this is how a slope could get destabilized during, uh, during uh, rainy season or during wet season and then there could be other causes like there, there is a pre-existing stable slope and we construct a very heavy structure near the top of the slope and this also is going to increase the destabilizing force and this in turn could lead into uh, a failure in this manner. There could be another reason, let us say a slope which is stable, it is afforested, the slope face has got a lot of vegetation on it and because of some reason the vegetation is uh, uh, it has it has uh, it has died out or it has been removed uh, because of some human action or because of natural wildfire or other reasons then what happens the binding power uh, that strengthens the near surface soil because of root penetration and because of the suction that the root actually uh, enforces near uh, within the near surface soil these two reasons are going to going to lead to the destabilization of the of the uh, of the slope in the event of loss of vegetation from the face of the slope so in case of that is the reason why in many situations if there is a deforestation following deforestation uh, in the hilly areas the instance of landslides also increase quite substantially and these process actually these triggers could also affect the uh, other types of uh, other types of slides that we are going to see in the next little bit uh, the next one that we are going to consider is a translational slide in case of rotational slide the movement was movement of the of the unstable soil or rock mass was rotational but in case of translational slide the movement is uh, really translational as the name suggests and there is an essential difference actually between translational slide and rotational slide in that in case of rotational slide normally what happens as the movement progresses the slope surface becomes uh, becomes less and less steep and as a result stability increases as the movement progresses but in case of translational slide stability does not increase with the movement because the slope remains quite as steep as it began with typically translational slide occurs through planes of weaknesses such as joints or slick and side joints slick and slide uh, slick, slick and many at many occasions uh, translational slide is triggered through planes of weaknesses such as joints 
slick and side and intrusions such as sand seams in clay. Uh, trigger and types of translational slide, how translational slide could be triggered? They could be due to pore water pressure increase or thickening or uh, increase of driving force because of a construction near the top of the uh, failure surface or because of loss of vegetation as we looked uh, when we were considering uh, the uh, rotational slide. Now, types of translational slides include block slide, slab slide or multiple slab, sli slab slide. What are these? We are going to come to that in the next little bit. Uh, this is an illustration cross section really of the uh, illustrating the process of block sliding. So, here what you see is a uh, is uh, pieces of rock they are going they are mobilized down slope uh, near the surface near the slope near the slope face. This type of slide is called block slide. Slab slide on the other hand is like this and there could be multiple slab side slab slide where the uh, during sliding the slab that is sliding down slope that breaks apart in small pieces. So, these are the different types of translational slides. There is another class of uh, landslide which is called a flow slide. In this particular case, material flows like a viscous fluid, uh, so called it is it moves just like uh, a liquid, but which has got some viscosity. Slow move the movement could be slow in some type of flow slide where the movement is because of uh, because of the fact that the material has come to near failure and the material is strain hardening. In that case, the movement is very slow, but typically this type of flow uh, the, the flow slides are very fast and far reaching if the material starts to soften progressively as the movement takes place. In this case, you could reach a velocity of between 15 to 60 kph and this type of flow slide could reach several kilometers down slope. And one such type of flow slide we have already looked at when we were talking about uh, talking about volcanic hazard and we were considering the sub, uh, considering the uh, the uh, hazard due to pyroclastic flow. So, pyroclastic flow is uh, is a fast uh, downslope movement of this category. Now, before uh, we move on, let me explain actually uh, what is what is meant by uh, strain softening and strain hardening. Now, if you plot the stress strain curves of a particular material, so this is the stress and that is strain and the response is like this. So, this is called strain hardening response. So, this type of material becomes stronger as the strain takes place. Whereas, if you have got strain softening material, then the response is like this. Here, the material loses strength as deformation uh, progresses. So, that is the reason why in case of strain softening material, the movement could be quite catastrophic uh, if a flow slide is triggered through that type of material, whereas in case of strain hardening material, the, the uh, movement is not typically catastrophic. Now, you need to realize the difference between sliding uh, versus flow slide, typical sliding versus flow slide. 
if you recall sliding is of this category this type in this case typically the movement is uh, relatively slower and the movement does not proceed to a great distance whereas in case of flow the soil becomes liquid like or the or the failure mass becomes like a liquid and you can realize liquid always tries to find a re relatively flat surface as a result the slide is only going to stabilize after the surface has become extremely flat a few degrees from horizontal and you should also look at the damage that this type of slide uh, could cause which is illustrated by the tumbling uh, by the by the uh, by the tree that has tumbled uh, down slope and the building uh, which was constructed uh, a little bit down slope so these uh, this illustrates what could happen and you could you could see you can see from here from this schematic sketch is that in this case because of the fact that the unstable mass actually behaves like a liquid the uh, the the object could float on top of this particular uh, destabilized mass okay now how flow slides could be triggered triggering of flow slide could be due to rise in pore water pressure and static liquefaction as you recall liquefaction is uh, is the phenomenon in which the uh, because of increase of pore water pressure the the uh, effective stress becomes almost zero and that could be triggered even without an earthquake it could be it could be triggered under static scenario because of rise of pore water pressure increase of moisture content increase of moisture content could soften many different types of uh, uh, particularly cohesive soils vibration and creep these are typical triggers of flow slides and types of flow slides include mud flow earth flow and debris flow rock creep and soliflaxion mud flow is a type of flow which involves basically fine grain material very fine grain material if you have got flow taking place comprised of uh, uh, coarser grain size it is called earth flow debris flow involves mixed grain sizes uh, involving boulders as well as fine grain soils rock creep is when a rock is uh, is deforming under uh, no increase of driving force without any increase of driving force because of the fact that under existing driving force the rock is rock mass is near failure and the material in this case if you recall from the discussion that we had a few minutes back is of the strain hardening type and soliflaxion is a uh, scenario in which there is a shallow uh, shallow uh, uh, intermittent downslope movement caused by uh, snow melt in fine grained soils because of snow melt the water content within moisture content within the shallow uh, soils uh, become larger and the soil becomes soggy and soggy soil is relatively uh, it becomes it becomes softer and that triggers intermittent downslope movement uh, but the, the last two categories of this group that we are discussing here are slow movements whereas mud flow earth flow and debris flow are quite fast a few uh, pictures i am going to quickly uh, go through these pictures this is a picture of uh, of Slumgullion earth flow in Colorado, United States. Uh, this is actually the, the flow characteristic is quite obvious uh, from the uh, from the uh, failure mass, which is visible uh, here near the near the middle of this particular picture. Uh, let me show the failure mass here. So this is the failure mass. You can see. You can easily infer the fluid-like property when it failed. Fluid-like property of this mass when it failed. This is an example of a landslide uh, involving rotational slides as well as debris flow. This slide was initiated as a rotational slide, as is evident from the failure scarp and the blocks 
uh, near multiple uh, multiple rotational slide in fact involving blocks near the top and the bottom portion of this particular uh, slide uh, it has got a flow like characteristic so uh, these are the blocks that I am uh, trying to refer to then then uh, you have got this is an example of a huge uh, block slide in Puerto Rico. Uh, the previous picture was from California actually. Uh, this one here is a huge block slide uh, uh, that involved in, several, uh, in more than 100 deaths in uh, Puerto Rico. It is a block slide which we, have, uh, which we have schematically illustrated earlier. Now uh, that really brings us to the end of this particular lesson. Uh, let's summarize what we learned. We looked at nature and mitigation strategies against shoreline erosion and depositional processes, looked at causes of landslides, and we looked at classification of landslides. We are going to wrap up this particular lesson with a question set. Uh, some of these questions are from the previous lesson because we didn't have, uh, I, we di I didn't have a chance of giving you a question set with the previous lesson. The first question is uh, what are the effects of near shore bathymetry on propagation of waves? Second one, how the problems of sedimentation due to longshore current is mitigated? Third one, landslides often occur following wet weather. What are the reasons? Deforestation leads to an increase in the frequency of landslides in hilly areas. Why? And the fifth one, which one of the following would be a fast moving slide? mud flow, rock creep and rock fall. Try to answer these questions at your leisure. I am going to provide you with my answers <coughs> when we meet uh, with the next lesson. So until we meet <coughs> uh, with the next lesson, bye for now. Thank you. And uh, welcome back. Uh, we, are, we are going to talk about, uh, uh, we are going to continue our discussion on geologic hazards related to landslide uh, in this lesson. Uh, so in this lesson, we are going to talk about landslide hazard zoning and we are going to look at a few mitigation strategies uh, typically uh, used to address landslide hazards. But before we go ahead with today's subject matter, let's look back at the question set of the previous lesson. Uh, these are the questions. The first one that I asked was, uh, what are the effects of near shore bathymetry on propagation of waves? Uh, as I discussed in the previous lesson, uh, the, if you have got a, a uh, protrusion of uh, a landform jutting into the, uh, jutting into the water, and the bathymetry also reflects that kind of uh, uh, that kind of onshore or subaerial topography. Then uh, that area is going to be affected by refraction and focusing of the wave energy. Uh, 